Our second uh, speaker today is Jason Tebalt, who is Executive Director of the Streaming Video Alliance, a global association of companies collaborating to solve critical challenges and delivering a better streaming experience. Uh, previously, he was at Limelight Networks, where he was a product manager and marketing strategist. He's an entrepreneur, an inventor on many technical patents in the streaming industry, and a contributing editor to Streaming Media Magazine. His presentation is Optimizing Video Delivery with the Open Caching Network. Jason. All right. Uh, I don't know how I follow that. Like, <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> That was, that was, that's amazing stuff. I mean, and again, so uh, total streaming nerd, that's, you know, very interesting to dig into. I absolutely want to hear more as Luvio sort of continues to progress. But uh, so let's take it up a notch here. Um, let's look at something that the Streaming Video Alliance has been working on for a few years called open caching and the open caching network and talk about that, how that solves some of sort of the critical challenges in really creating a great viewer experience because that's what we're all after, right? When we talk about streaming, we're talking about creating a wonderful viewing experience. Um, so a little bit about the Streaming Video Alliance. You don't know who we are. We're a global association, I guess, you know, similar to SMPTE or IETF or CTA. Uh, we just don't focus on standards. Uh, we focus in on best practices, guidelines, functional specs, technical requirements uh, to solve some of those critical problems. Um, this is kind of a smattering of our member companies. We've got about 70 member companies to date, but some of the big names in streaming, so we've got the Disney folks, Amazons, the Googles, um, and they're all coming to the table, you know, competitors in many cases, to figure out how to solve some of these problems. Uh, we address a bunch of different topics. Uh, these are some of our working groups. So again, similar to SMPTE, similar to, to other organizations. Uh, we have groups that focus in on specific topics and we you know, create, again, publications that we make available to the industry as a whole so we don't uh, sequester them just to our members. We actually publish them publicly and it's great because then everyone can come and participate and, and sort of improve those documents as, as time goes on. All right, so what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about streaming video. Now, I think it goes without saying that there's a transition happening. There's, there's, a, there's a deep transition in broadcasting happening, right? And that's the movement from sort of SDI and QAM to IP. I think we all understand that's been happening for decades. What's happening now is sort of the output of that, which is a user experience dedicated around any device, anywhere, anytime access to what would be traditional linear broadcast. So what I see on my TV, I want to see on my laptop, more importantly, I want to see on my mobile phone. Um, so as you probably are aware, if you've read Cisco's VNI Global Report, um, you know, and actually, um, you know, Michelle had some of that, a graph of that in her, um, in her presentation, a graph or two of that. You know, I think 80% of mobile IP traffic is going to be video by 2022 or something like that crazy, right? It's all about mobile. It's all about video. And not only that, it's really actually becoming about live, right? So in the streaming industry, and I, I kind of segment it as its own little industry, but it's really not, right? It's part of you know, the broadcast industry as a whole. Um, VOD has sort of been solved, right? The on-demand use case, the on-demand experience, you know, thanks Netflix, it's wonderful. You know, 40% of the people cram the internet trying to watch your shows in prime time, and you guys have done a great job. But it's live, it's where everything's moving. So I actually talked to um, the, the CTO of NBC Sports. I heard him talk. And he said that, I think it was a year and a half or two years ago, NBC Sports had delivered something like, I don't know, 187 live events. And then he gave this talk two years later and he was like, well, this year I think we delivered like 3,800 events. So live streaming is where everything is moving towards and the need for creating a broadcast-like experience for live streaming is critical. Right? So users want an experience that's similar to their TV. They want to sit down, turn on the, you know, the, the TV with the remote, and it just works. Um, and the problem is they want a streaming that's similar to that broadcast experience, especially for live. Right? They don't want the goal to be scored 30 seconds after that they're actually watching it. Right? So they're listening to their neighbor, and their neighbors are, or they're looking at their Twitter feed, and there's the goal scored, and then they see it on, t on their streaming, and they get all pissed off. Um, that's what we want to solve, and that's where open caching sort of comes in. Now, just a little bit of stats on, on streaming, just, just to put this to bed. Um, so as of this year, according to IHS Market, there were, I think they're predicting about 473 million subscriptions worldwide. Now, I, I get it, 
in the grand scheme of television watching, that's nothing, right? That's a drop in the bucket. Um, you know, streaming still only represents a small fraction of the amount of video consumed, but this is a 73% increase over 2017. So it's growing super rapidly, right? People are looking to this format. They want their operators and their video distributors to provide them a streaming experience. And then from a business perspective, according to Juniper Research, by about 2020, this is going to equate to about $120 billion. Again, not trivial, but in the grand scheme of things, smaller than the whole market, right? Obviously, the television broadcast market is huge. Streaming is a small portion of that. They're sort of mixing together, right? As again, as things move towards IP and as more broadcasters and more network operators realize that it's cheaper to move content around and deliver content via IP than it is via satellite and downlink, this is just going to continue to grow, right? People are going to want more OTT. Now, the problem with this, though, as you get more people watching more online video, you, you get a scale problem. So we talk about big events. People say like, hey, I had this event. It was the Super Bowl, man. We had like 3.5 million concurrent viewers. And I'm like, 3.5 mi that's it? <laughs> where, where are the rest of the people? Oh yeah, they were watching it on TV, right? So, but this does create a scale problem because, you know, as Michelle pointed out, the internet is not built for video delivery. Never was, never was intended to be. TCP was never intended to be a great protocol for small chunk delivery. Lots of round trips, lots of drop packets, lots of issues the network was never created for. Now, one could argue that Internet 2, which is pretty awesome if you ever get a chance to see some of the stats behind that, is great for video. We still have a scale problem with what we have delivered today. And the thing with the scale is a very simple sort of equation, right? As scale goes up, this is generally speaking, as scale goes up with video delivery over the internet, over unmanaged networks, quality goes down, right? And what do we mean by quality? So we mean by increase in buffering, right? So you get longer times to fill buffers, you get more rebuffering, you get a higher rebuffer ratio, you know, users hate that, right? You also get a longer time to first byte, so you don't get the video starting up as soon. And then you also have lower bit rates being served, right? So scale creates some major, major problems when it comes to delivering a, a broadcast-like online video experience. Now, the question then becomes is, how do we fix that? So, you know, Michelle's got some really great ideas with Luvio and her company and sort of how they solve that. There's other companies out there trying to figure out how do we solve this scale problem? How do we grow infrastructure to support uh, an unknown number of viewers at any given time and provide the highest quality of experience? That's a really hard thing to do. So, in order to solve that problem, you have to understand sort of what's involved with content delivery, right? How does a video, who's involved with delivering a video to a user? So you've got sort of three constituents. You've got a content provider, so they have an origin server. That origin server may be located in conjunction with a service provider, which is your CDNs. And then you've got your operator networks. They're your ISPs. They're your eyeball networks, right? They control the last mile between these two and their user and their viewer. So the problem is today, the way most of this happens is the operator network gets that. They get a fire hose of content from the CDN because CDNs, although they peer with content delivery networks in the major peering points, they just terminate on their network. So they're just dumping traffic. So it's up to the operator to manage it, right? So they have to backhaul it, they have to prioritize it, and it's really, really difficult when your network was never built for that kind of traffic. So there's a way to solve this, which is actually creating a much better system by putting the content as close to the user as possible. Now, this seems totally obvious. Well, of course, if you put the content closer, there's less round trip time, it's a better experience, the content comes faster, there's no backhaul back up through the operator network to the internet or to the CDN to get the content. That makes total sense. Why haven't we done that before? That's a great question. Now, Netflix has done this, right? So Netflix created their own caching box, and they put those boxes in operator networks to solve that problem, right? They want to create the shortest distance between the viewer request and the content that's being served. Now, mind you, it's only for popular content, and it requires a lot of business relationships, right? Netflix has a business relationship with all these operator networks. 
So they're going to each and every one of them and negotiating with them, let us put our server in your network, we'll solve this problem, your user will be happy, bang, done. Now could you imagine if 500 OTT providers did that? Network operators would be overwhelmed. They don't want 500 business relationships, 500 different servers in their network serving content to their users. So the Netflix model, although great for Netflix, not so good for everybody else. Now, the other problem we have, so we don't have content stored close enough to the end user. We don't have it out on the edge. The other problem we have is there's a disconnect between all those constituents in the delivery chain, right? So the content providers, they're kind of talking to the CDNs. The CDNs are kind of talking to the ISPs, but nobody's really sharing any data. No one's moving information back and forth so that everyone understands what's happening with the delivery experience, and that's a problem. So what the Streaming Video Alliance did about four years ago when we founded is we came up with this concept called the Open Caching Network. And the Open Caching Network is plain and simple, kind of an open source way for all those three constituents to get involved in the delivery chain and share information about the content that's being delivered and host that content way out at the edge. So again, pre-positioned content, cache content that's popular, ensure that the user has the shortest round trip time to getting what they want to watch. Now, we come up with a bunch of specs, and I'll kind of go over those in just a second, but there's three main pieces to the open caching network. First of all, there's a controller, right? So there's a caching controller that deals with the management of information that goes between the different constituents. So a caching node in one operator network knows and can communicate with a caching node in another operator network can communicate with a caching node in a CDN. The request router actually deals with handling the request from the user and where that content goes, so what caching node actually responds to the request and delivers content. And then last is the caching node, and that is just for all intents and purposes a physical bare metal box hosted in the operator network with lots of storage. Oh, lots of memory as well. All right, so the way this works, let me talk about the request routing first, and I keep saying that like it's a tongue twister. Um, so we have two ways in the open caching network that request routing, <laughs> see, I did it again. What, I'm just gonna do Bugs Bunny from now on. There's two things in the request routing that can happen. No, okay. Um, the request routing can happen one of two ways. First is an HTTP redirect, so it's a 302. So what happens is the user request goes out to the CDN, uh, the CDN cache redirects it to the request router in the open caching network, which then finds the node nearest or most appropriate to that user's request and serves the content from there. Now, the problem with the 302, it adds round trip time, right? So you actually have a round trip even before anything meaningful happens that occurs, so that adds additional latency. And, and, and Michelle had pointed out a really good thing. So if you've never heard the 200 millisecond number, that's how fast you blink your eye. So if you're delivering content anything faster than 200 milliseconds, people don't notice. So 500 is a really great bar. Um, the problem is, is that you know, it all compounds, right? There's so many pieces in the delivery value chain that add little bits of millisecond latency that all of a sudden you're like 1.5 seconds instead of 500 milliseconds. So this is a way to get that content faster um, while, again, not undermining sort of the, the, the value chain. Um, the second way that we can deliver content in the request router whoa, uh, is by DNS much more preferable method, right? So obviously uh, the DNS is pointed to the router so that the request goes there and then it can find the open caching node most appropriate and, and, and deliver the content. Much faster, there's no extra round trip times um, and, and it's a much more clean implementation. So the specification uh, for request routing that we've developed actually includes both of these methods. Now, in terms of the control plane, so what's happening here, the controller is great. It's just managing all of the things that are happening within the open caching network. So like content prepositioning, content purging, metadata, logging, everything is being sort of handled by this, no, by this controller, and the controllers communicate or can communicate it to each other so that controllers located in different networks can actually share the same information and the same data everyone's on the same page. So this is why the open caching network is so great for multiple participants to actually come together and deliver a better viewer experience you know, than, than just one person trying to go it alone. 
Now, obviously, this requires some coordination. So the thing that we've done in this uh, open caching network is we've kind of had uh, uh, coordination done in, in two ways. One is by um, sort of routing, right? So obviously via the 302 and the DNS, we want to move the request for content very efficiently and effectively. But the second way is through API. So all of the coordination that happens in the network is handled by different types of APIs. So we have APIs for metadata, we have APIs for purging, we have APIs for logging, and it's the APIs that actually allow the different constituents and the different machines and infrastructure and different networks to communicate with each other. So now everyone's operating from the same spec, remember, association, we develop specs, so everyone's operating along the same spec. They're all communicating to each other via these API and data can be shared between content provider and ISP or CDN and content provider or CDN and ISP. So they're all using the same information to maximize and optimize the delivery experience. Now obviously the question then becomes is what does it take for somebody to get involved in the open caching network? Like what does a content provider have to do? Well, really, a content provider just needs to get prepared, right? They need to be prepared to optimize content, to make sure that they can reroute effectively, that their content has the right headers, that they're sort of ready for what the open caching network signifies in terms of moving their content in an open caching node and to the request, the request router and then to the user. So it's really for them very easy to get involved. The heavy lifting actually comes at the CDN level, right? So the CDNs have to do a lot of um, you know, sort of legwork or groundwork in order to make sure that their caches um, basically adhere to the specification, which enables them to sort of partake in all the communication that's going back and forth. So we're not suggesting to the CDNs like, hey, you need to replace all your caches with open caching nodes, but they need to use the APIs and some sort of software harness at the edge to allow their caches to communicate with open caches and make sure that that content, again, that data flow um, is uninterrupted. So they've got a little bit of heavy lifting, but on the provider side, on the network operator side, obviously they've got infrastructure to, to, to deploy, right? So they've got caches, right? physical bare metal boxes that are open caching nodes. They've got to put them somewhere in their network. Uh, so they've got a bit more work to do than anybody else, and um, obviously, it, you know, it's a it's not a Herculean effort. You know, obviously, there are vendors out in the market now offering open caching solutions, like Quilt, for example. Um, there are companies that do this, so they can turn to them. But they do have a bit of work to accomplish in order to partake and participate in the open caching network concept. Now, obviously, the question becomes: Is hey, Jason, that's really interesting. Great concept, like. So what does it look like in real life? Um, so we have actually put it to the test. Uh, we did a proof of concept uh, last year. Uh, all that's published on our website, so there's actually detailed information about that. It involved, I think, seven companies. It was, um, at the time, BAM Tech, which is now Disney Streaming Services, uh, Viacom, Verizon, um, I'm blanking on the other guys. But they all sort of got together um, and said, okay, let's run a piece of content through this. Let's deploy infrastructure. Let's set up the DNS. I think at the time we actually did 302 routing. So let's set up the routing. Let's create this and see it run. And what we saw was that just on you know, non-optimized network paths, non-optimized delivery, we saw about kind of the same performance that you would normally get from traditional CDN delivery. Um, the cool thing is, is we actually saw a little bit better bit rate. So the average bit rate in CDN delivery was like 5.2 megabits per second. We saw 5.9. Uh, we saw a little bit better on, on sort of the rebuffer ratio as well. Now, again, it's non-optimized. Um, we're actually planning to do a second POC. I think it's probably going to be sometime next year, which is going to incorporate more of the specs that we've developed since this POC. But the results were fantastic, right? The results demonstrated that an open caching network could actually improve, even marginally improve delivery and the experience, but even more so get everybody communicating, right? Get that data sharing between different parts so that everyone's involved in the delivery and in ensuring that the viewers got a great experience. All right, I told you I would show this slide. And as you can tell, this is the only slide with lots of text on it. So I don't want you to necessarily read it. You can download it. Um, I made the slides available. All the specs are available on our website. You can download any of them. They're all in PDF format. Uh, but basically, we've tried to cover a number of 
uh, the, you know, a, a bunch of ground with respect to, to content delivery workflow. Um, the main one you should probably grab is the functional requirements, right? It describes what the open caching network is. And then all the other specs are obviously very, very germane to specific elements of the open caching network, whether it's the request router or whether it's, you know, management operations or logging. Um, they're actually working on a number of specs right now, including things like uh, security, um, including um, they're actually doing some um, uh, modifications to uh, IETF CDNI. So we're actually going to see some cross-pollination between what the Alliance is doing and what um, IETF is doing. So we'll have some, hopefully, some joining together of that so we can get to sort of one vision of this shared caching delivery infrastructure that I think everyone's been kind of bouncing around for, you know, probably about the better part of 10 years. All right. I mean, my last thing I got to say about this is really it takes everyone to participate. Right, this has been the problem to date is that everyone's sort of done everything in a silo. Yeah, I'm a content provider. I got to get my content to my user. I'm going to go cut a deal with uh, the important ISP to me. Maybe that's Comcast. And I'm going to deal with the CDNs I want to deal with. And I'm going to keep the CDNs separate from each other. And it's just very siloed. We've got to come together sort of as an industry around something like open caching, uh, sort of non-federated approach to content delivery so that everyone can participate and everyone can get involved in the delivery and that makes for a better end user experience. And with that said, I say thanks, but I will stop for a moment and ask if there are any questions. I, say, I save time for questions. I feel so proud of myself. Good, good. <laughs> well, actually, I do have one uh, oh. to kind of kick things off. Um, and it's, it's uh, not so much exactly about the technology, but um, as you may or may not know, um, SMPTE now has a uh, specification process. Woo! And uh, we did deliver our first specification with the DPP uh, 2121. Perhaps we can uh, get you to sit down with our standards VP, Mr. Devlin. And, uh, perhaps this becomes technical specification 2122. Yeah, see, that, that would be fantastic. I mean, what we do as an organization is we generally push our specs and our work to other industry bodies. So, uh, for example, the CTA Wave is uh, standardizing QOE measurement for video. So they took our definitions of QOE measurements as a starting point. Um, you know, the problem is, you know, honestly, with streaming video, um, it's moving so fast, right? The technology is changing so often. I mean, just look at the containers, right? We had HLS, and then we had Dash, and now we have CMAF, right? It's just, it's constantly, like we have encoders, right? We had MPEG, and then we got AV1, and now we've got uh, VVTs coming in. So it's just, it's constant change. If you standardize anything now, like by the time you're done with your standard, sort of in three years from now or five years from now, it, the technology's moved on. And, so, that's, and that's the point of yeah. the specification versus the existing. Yes, big fan of specs. Any other questions? Other questions for Jason? And again, streamingvideoalliance.org, all the specs are up there under our technical working sort of menu option. So you can go download whatever you want, pass it around. We love feedback. If you've got ideas, um, you know, we can get those into our working group and sort of, you know, again, iterate on these specifications um, as we continue to move forward. But uh, they're all available for you to, to go and look at and consider um, both from a technical perspective and a business perspective how they might fit into your organizations. Sure. All right. Woo! Open caching. <laughs>so I did write a, a, a elaborated paper, and uh, I think uh, might be an opportunity for that that paper to to get printed. So uh, uh, be looking for that. And m my only thought on that was uh, honestly try to to uh, uh, not to over advertise before we finished everything. And uh, I like to release these things when we're all done. So. Quick one. Um Increasingly, we're delivering unique copies to individuals, either because they're watermarked or 
some other reason? Have you thought about what the impact of that would be on a system that uses caching? Can, can you repeat your question? I got put just a little bit of it. Say it one more time. We're using, we're often more frequently than before delivering individual copies, watermarked, yep. for example. How does that play in? Well, you might have noticed, or well, actually you couldn't have because I didn't get to my demo, but we actually apply a watermark in that, that Bitcode transformation pipeline as just one such personalization per recipient, right? And that could be per content or per recipient either way. And, and I think the, the, the whole point of this just-in-time theme, it, it, it's really derived from, from, from two foundational things going on. The first is from the user perspective and just the value of media, the, the, the push for personalization, it, it, it you know, arguably creates the best possible user experience. The, the second reason is reuse reuse of the same content so that we can avoid storage duplication, network bandwidth duplication throughout the, the, the entire pipeline. And as some other obvious examples beyond just watermarking, think of how we, I mean, any kind of quote unquote advertising product placement or uh, if you will, any directed personalization for the point of, of marketing is, is per recipient. Right. Obviously, we also do a lot of work up front to prepare for the user's end device situation, which could also be done just on just in time. And then finally is interactive experiences. And I think the growth of services like Twitch have shown us that you know, nowadays, m media is certainly not one way. <laughs> and, and beyond that, also that those functions need to not only be programmable, but also more or less real time. So I think these are kind of all the, the, the reasons that the, this, this just-in-time notion is so important. But I do want to recognize, obviously, this puts a heavy um, a premium on compute. And the only way this works is if the rest of the system, A, the security's got to work so we can have contribution of compute, otherwise you don't get off the starting block, right? And the second is that that whole system has got to work right pricing-wise, otherwise, uh, you, you know, how do you really get the right compute in the right places at the right time? And, and that, that's a big problem, right? It's uh, obviously, it's, you know, part of the, the thoughts behind this, the, the, this system, um, but uh, it, it's, it's a new paradigm. Thanks very much. Okay, so we shall uh, move on to our final speaker today. Our final speaker is Bob Seidel. Bob is Vice President of Engineering and Advanced Technology at CBS and currently the SMPTE past president with 15 years now of, of uh, executive committee and board service. Uh, Bob holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Lehigh University and before joining CBS, uh, worked for the U.S. Department of Defense and Electronic Countermeasures. Uh, as Vice President of Television Engineering, he directed the design and installation of the CBS Broadcast Origination Center. Uh, and subsequent, and then later on in July of, 90, uh, excuse me, at, later on he led the engineering team that made WRALHD in Raleigh, North Carolina, the first station to transmit high-definition television in July of 1996. Bob is an SMPTE fellow. He received an Emmy for his work in portable satellite uplink uh, systems for worldwide news gathering, and in 2014 was a recipient of the NAB TV Engineering Achievement Award. Uh, about approximately four years ago, I think, Bob spoke on CBS All Access as it had just been launched. And he's here today to give us an update uh, on, the on the progress of CBS All Access uh, four years later. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Seidel. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I'd like to update you on uh, CBS All Access. Uh, let's see, do we have the clicker here? Yes. Oh, here we are. Here we go. Um, rather than talk about our software stacks that we've employed for this, that I'm all of you have uh, running at some point in your networks, I thought I'd talk about some of the business issues that we've had to develop technology to meet because as a broadcaster, we are a little different than the average streaming service. So the main problem and challenge that broadcasters are, are faced with today in delivering mobile and over-the-top devices is that 
a license is granted by the network to the affiliated station to broadcast the content in their DMA. And this is true for ABC, NBC, CBS, and they are not allowed to export that content outside of that DMA. However, as we know, the internet and mobile devices don't really know about DMAs at all. So therefore, we had needed to develop technology that would geofence the signal to just the DMA that they were authorized to distribute in. So this ensured that we wouldn't be violating existing sports contracts, sports contracts or, or network programming rules or syndication programming rules that the broadcast world has had to live with and now we're conforming those to the online world. The second problem local broadcasters face is how to ensure that all the TV viewing devices that their signal might appear on gets measured, whether it's the big screen in the living room or the mobile phone or the tablet. We want to monetize our content so that there are no leakages within the monitoring system so we can get full credit for the viewers that are watching our content. And finally, we wanted to create a broadcast uh, distribution system for mobile and OTT devices that provided a second revenue stream for the broadcaster and the content producers. So the business success rate of mobile television services uh, provided by traditional broadcast transmission towers, tall towers, high power, uh, has been proved to be a challenging endeavor not only in the U.S., but on a global basis. The failure rate appears to be independent of the technology or the modulation selected for the service. Some of the notable efforts that have not succeeded included TV Global's uh, service in Brazil, which is a COFDM-based service, uh, Qualcomm's MediaFlow service here in the U.S., DVBH, the Dial and Mobile 500 service uh, using the ATSC MH standard, and the Swiss broadcast uh, in Switzerland, as well as uh, Mobilecom and Orange in Austria, Mediaset in Italy, and Antenna Hungary. All of these systems were not a commercial success. So we had to think about that and how would we do it differently in order to provide a service. The mobile uh, TV capital startup costs have been very high for the broadcaster and the cellular carriers have been less than enthusiastic about the possibility of include, including mobile uh, uh, receiving capability in their devices since it conflicts and bypasses or may reduce their business of selling data services to the consumer. These unsuccessful attempts led CBS to develop all access. And we wanted to make sure that we could deliver our broadcast linear content as well as the library content to hundreds of millions of existing devices. We didn't want to have specialized hardware in order to receive the signal. We wanted to use existing devices. And we wanted to make it available on all networks, whether it's 3G, 4G, LTE, eventually 5G, the 400,000 hotspots that exist in the US, and of course, broadband connections. We wanted it to replicate the DMA of the station, and we wanted a low capital investment for the station so they weren't burdened with uh, massive deployment of uh, transmitters and equipment. And finally, we wanted to make sure that it could be captured and monetized by Nielsen so that we would get all of the viewing, not just on the big screen set. And specifically, we wanted to target the CBS superfans that tend to binge watch our content and after that, they come back to watch the mothership on a linear basis, as well as the 12 million broadband-only households that exist in the U.S. So in addition to the mobile, uh, allowing the mobile consumer to view our live streams, we also wanted to offer access to 10,000 episodes of CBS content. So this is essentially the entire library. It includes such classics as Frasier, I Love Lucy, uh, Mission Impossible, Perry Mason, Twilight Zone, two of my favorites, JAG and, and Star Trek. All Access also provides access to all of our current programs. So as soon as they air after prime time, 
They're posted to the all access site for viewing. We also wanted to make sure our daytime programming and specials were all available. And a lot of this had to do with ensuring that all the clearances were in place to ensure that we could broadcast them and stream them. So that was one of the major challenges in making sure that all of this content could be delivered uh, to the consumer. We've also been producing first-run original content to entice viewers to the site. So we're now offering The Good Fight, No Activity, Star Trek Discovery, which is really driving subscriptions, Strange Angel, and many others. So it's not only about the content that's on the air, it's about first-run original content. For their local station, one of their largest revenue uh, producing streams is local news. So we wanted to make sure that we could have local news available to the consumer on the all access platform. Here's just a brief shot of some of the screens that you get to as you enter the service. The first here is the home page, and you can go into the schedule, and then you can go into the live streaming uh, services. So you can not only watch the live local affiliate, but you also have access to the CBS N channel, which is our 24 hour streaming service. So you can also watch the news service. And our CBS HQ, which is our sports streaming service. So you get it all. So to date, we have deployed it in 200 markets, covering nearly 99% of the US households. And we've completed business relationships with many of the uh, group owned stations, just putting a few of them up here. So the heart of the system is uh, pretty darn simple, and I'm not going to go into software stacks, but all, all access was intended to use the, uh, essentially the same signal that's going to the transmitter. Essentially, we want to distribute that signals to 3G, 4G, and all the other distribution systems. We wanted to have it geofenced, and we chose SyncBack as our geofencing technology. Um, once SyncBack verifies the location of the device in the market, it then connects you to the market of, of, that you're in. As you move across the country, you will be connected to other services. We've also built some hysteresis into the system. So if you started watching, let's say, the Boston Red Sox and you're driving down to New York, we'll keep you with that stream. We're not going to switch you away. So there's hysteresis built into the system so we don't annoy the viewers. So it all starts at the master control of the station where we add the Nielsen watermark. And if you're not familiar with that, it's really composed of three layers of watermarking. These are subliminal audio codes that are added to the stream. The network adds their code uh, first as it leaves the network. These are program distributor codes. And then the local station adds their final distributor code so that we can actually track the signal through the entire distribution chain. When it hits the uh, cable or satellite provider, a second final distributor code can be added to the signal. So once it goes through the Nielsen watermark encoder, it goes to traditional AC3, uh, ATSC1 encoder, and then finally to the transmitter. We bridge off a feed from that and transcode it in the syncback transcoder. It's in the syncback transcoder that we do a number of conversions. We convert it from MPEG-2 to MPEG-4, AC-3 to AAC. And one of the significant things is we read the audio watermark that's in the signal. And we then convert it to an ID-3 tag. Now, if you're not familiar with an ID-3 tag, that is the same packaging and format used for iTunes to indicate song title, author, duration, all of that. And set, we use the same packaging, essentially, but stick, stick in source identification, date, time, final distributor code, program distributor code, et cetera. This enables us to get at the data in the phone because the security and, and protection systems in the mobile devices is, are so good, they prevent another application from accessing the audio stream. So we needed to develop a method to provide a sidecar data signal that would give us access to the Nielsen data. So once it goes through the firewall, it's onto the SyncBack data center where we do the geolocation. So all of the DMAs consists of polygons, latitude and longitude coordinates, 
And the SyncBack data center can either use the GPS data coming from the phone or Wi-Fi hotspot data or triang triangulations with cell towers to determine the device location. It authorizes the stream and then it's handed off to the content delivery networks, uh, which we know are going to hope work faster in the future. <laughs> so um, the CDNs, uh, we actually have some uh, load balancing software that allows us to distribute the signal to multiple CDNs and pick the CDN that's providing us the lowest rebuffering and response time. So we're actively very selective in which CDN we use to provide the best user experience. This also provides us redundancy if one CDN begins to have difficulty, we can switch over instantaneously to the other CDNs. On the bottom, you also know we use this signal to go to other OTT services, which I'll talk about in a moment. But once the signal reaches the uh, device, the CBS All Access application using the uh, Nielsen Software Development Kit accesses the ID3 tag and actually returns that data to the Nielsen crediting engine. So we measure every device, so it's not a Nielsen panel of uh, 10,000 or 60,000 homes, it's essentially census data of every device uh, that uh, is viewing the signal. So in order to do a proof of concept, uh, we actually conducted a trial using CBS employees and we actually measured whether we were ably, able to decode the uh, signal successfully and compare it against the session logs that existed uh, from SyncBack. And we, find that we found a very high correlation. Uh, in order to meet the minimum criteria for Nielsen crediting, you must be watching for two minutes. So that's how the crediting engine works. So the uh, white paper that we produced showed there was a high degree of correlation between the session logs and uh, the actual uh, watermark. This is just a typical stack that we have in terms of di uh, the dynamic streaming. Uh, we have multiple stacks. I just included this one as an example. Depending upon what device we're going to and what provider and the size of the device, there are many stacks within the system that we can actually uh, pull from uh, to de generate the data. It's a very simple installation. It's a one rack unit device. Uh, I, we always have two of them at each station, so we have diversity. We have a diverse route path out of the station on two different uh, delivery systems, so that if one is uh, experiencing a firewall problem or uh, rebuffering, we can actually switch to the other. So you simply take the ASI signal into, of the station into it and connect the other end uh, to your Ethernet router. The most difficult problem is usually getting the corporate firewall guys to get the rules right. So <laughs> it seems like everyone has that issue. And of course, we want to be FCC compliant with captioning. So we uh, transcode all of the captioning and make that readily available on the service. So you can also see uh, hearing impaired people can also enjoy the service uh, with no issues. We still have a few programs, maybe provided by a syndicator, that will require a blackout. And we had to provide facilities for this, so there is uh, essentially a contact clo closure that can occur at the station automation to actually black out the signal if necessary. Uh, we have cleared almost every CBS program and commercial, so we really don't have an issue on the network. Uh, there are some still syndicated programs at the local level that need to be blacked out. Um, the station, alternatively, can provide a separate stream into the encoder if they don't want to just put up a blackout slide. We also provide the station with monitoring so they can actually see their signal coming back from the CDN, and this is just a typical uh, sync back monitor program. We can look at individual stations or at our network operations center in New York and Los Angeles and at sync back. We monitor all 200 stations and can see uh, exactly what's happening on the network. And we have on the right here, you can see uh, some of the data statistics that we monitor on rebuffering and, and uh, retries, so we have a very good indication of the health of the network. It's also convenient to see if everyone's carrying the proper program. We've had a couple of stations uh, that were carrying the wrong football game and it required a phone call to uh, advise them of their error. 
So we're not just on mobile phones. We're on a whole plethora of devices. We're on Roku. We're on Xbox 360. We're on PlayStation. We're on Vizio TVs. We're on Samsung TVs. We're on Fire TV, uh, Apple TV. So we're on a plethora of devices, and this is increasing every day. And this gives us, as broadcasters, we want to be to the broadest possible audience, not just over the air, not just cable, not just satellite. We want to be broadest as we can and broadcast. We also provide a stream for a number of uh, our other TV providers that if you are an authenticated cable customer of, let's say, Optimum, you can get access to the stream. So we've extended this to a number of their services that they have. So it's not just these individual devices. It's also the traditional providers that I've listed here. One unique aspect of this service is CBS NewsPath, which gathers uh, news for our affiliated stations, essentially is using the system to rapidly pick up breaking news. Traditionally, you had to order up a satellite uh, link, KU band truck, coordinate, get it uplinked, and then we could distribute the uh, news. Now, we can just tune in to the station's local uh, signal and put that up on the network for further distribution after we receive the affiliate's approval. So we're using this to, again, in many different ways, to expand the CBS network reach and provide a news gathering and instantaneous news. So if they have an ENG truck on site, we can very quickly get that up on the network and out. So in summary, we think that uh, this system is providing all of our business needs. It's preserving the existing business requirements that we have for our local affiliates. It's providing a real-time, a live linear uh, viewing capability uh, across the board. Uh, it's measured by Nielsen, so we're getting accreditation. So it's providing additional viewers. And what we're finding is that younger viewers are using the service. So overall, it's driving down the average age. And of course, advertisers are interested in the lower age groups. So it's helping us on the uh, average age uh, numbers as well. Um, because it is um, also, it's providing an opportunity for revenue sharing. Since it is a subscription service, there is a subscription uh, fee for uh, commercials delivered, and there's also a subscription fee slightly higher for commercial free. We share in this revenue stream with the affiliates, so they're really getting two sources of new revenue. They're getting the mobile viewer measured, which is adding to the total content rating number reported by Nielsen, and they're getting a part of the subscription revenue. So based on this, we think it's been adding, really reaching all of our uh, business goals and is uh, continuing to become more popular as more subscribers sign up. So could you please roll the video clip? Introducing CBS All Access, the anytime, anywhere television streaming service that gives you access to more CBS shows than any other source. Like live TV, current and past seasons of CBS shows, new episodes the day after they air, and your fan favorites. Thousands of episodes are at your fingertips. So start browsing because CBS is now available on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. That's CBS All Access. Get your free week now by going to cbs.com slash all access. With CBS All Access, you can watch CBS2 News live and watch more of your favorite CBS shows on demand across computers, tablets, and smartphones. Go to cbs.com slash all access now to try it for free. And thank you very much. Uh, we do have time for questions, if anyone has questions for Bob. That on, yeah. Uh, so you guys have a version of the service that's um, subscription-based with ads. How have you, you know, how have you approached ad delivery within the streams? Is it server-side stitching? Is it client-side delivery? And sort of, do you have um, advertisers wanting ad parity, like those who are sort of delivering a nationwide ad via the linear broadcast, saying, "Hey, we want that same ad in certain regions, you know, of the of the app." 
Yeah, for the linear broadcast, you get the ads no matter what. <laughs> so you don't have a choice there. For the VOD service, uh, that is all dynamic ad insertion on server side. And as an advertiser, you can choose whether you want that ad carried over from the linear network to appear in that stream for uh, seven days. Because wow. Nielsen is, for CBS, Nielsen gives us credit for live plus seven days. Uh, for CW, I think it's uh, live plus three. So it's, it's up to the advertiser. Okay. Uh, name and, aff and affiliation, please. I wonder if you could talk to the future migration path for CBS All Access in terms of any plans, uh, for example, to use higher resolutions or to leverage the features of ATSC 3.0. We're looking at higher resolutions right now. If you subscribe, uh, you can watch uh, Star, Star Trek Discovery in 4K. So uh, it's, it does increase the uh, storage requirements quite a bit <laughs> mm. uh, for a typical file. So uh, that is the only uh, asset that we now have up that's at a higher rate. Any uh, plans to incorporate HDR? Uh, actually, HDR is available for Star Trek as well. Any, uh, any other programs besides Star Trek? Um, stay tuned. We're getting, we're, we're looking. Yes. Thank you. I had a question. Um, you mentioned you use the MPEG-4 video codec. Mm -hmm. It's a fairly old codec, and I was just interested, what was your uh, rationale for that? It's well developed. It works in a lot of devices. Uh, we find it in a lot of television sets. So. Our goal is to reach the broadest possible audience rather than going for a codec that is not as widely distributed. Hello, Robert. I'm Lewis Johnson with Arrington Johnson, LLC. I have a question regarding passing through uh, descriptive narration on the programming provided either through CBS or other sources. You've uh, mentioned that you've you've got closed captioning, but a lot of services like Hulu, they do not pass this information with their programming content. Uh, has your system accommodated that accessibility? Yes, um, the program stream that is going out to the transmitter includes both essentially the 5.1 uh, surround sound services as well as a separate audio descriptive audio service uh, and that can either contain Spanish during NFL games, uh, a um, mono down mix of the 5-1, or it can, can contain descriptive uh, video uh, for our selected shows. That right now is going through the uh, transcoder, and we're now looking at upgrading the devices, the plethora of devices, to include that feature. So that is on our development timeline. Excellent, thank you. I'm Mark Harrison from the DPP. Um, I'm going to try and tie Bob and Michelle's pieces together, which is, as a non-technologist, it's uh, probably insane, since I can barely understand a word of uh, Michelle's piece. <laughs> but if I do understand the thrust of where it's heading, um, then my question, Bob, is, it, and this is more of a business than a tech question, do you, do you have a sense of how many different content playing apps you know, consumers now have in North America? And you know, are, are you as a network yet sort of playing with the idea that eventually consumers are gonna want to be able to just access any content from anywhere on a micro pay-as-you-use basis? Start. <laughs> you should start because you've got the running service, then maybe I'll give a thought or two. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Give me a chance to think. <laughs> okay. All right. I get to have this. So I was going to compliment Bob because I love CBS All Access. It works really well. It's great content, too. Anyway, um, of course, I, I think that's the case, but it, it's, it's less about wanting everything everywhere as it is 
why shouldn't it have built, been built in a way where it doesn't really matter what the platform is, right? And, and we are living in the opposite of that today. And one of the things, the questions I wanted to ask Bob was, what an elegant approach to such a, and practical approach to such a multivaried world right. as it presently exists, right? And I think looking forward from the technology side, it's if we do have a chance to do this different and better, how could we eliminate the need for multi-everything, right? Where it's device, DRM, and, and also CDN, right? Meaning, you know, why is it that we have to you know, prepare for ab absolutely every possibility within different variations as opposed to having a systemic flexibility in the way that we're doing things so that's no longer so so necessary so but speaking to a running service <laughs> well once we get you in the store we like to keep you in the store so. of, course, of course you do yeah <laughs> so that's why we've added all of these other live streaming services like cbsn because it gives 24-hour access uh, to news and yeah. CBS HQ it gives you 24 access to sports so by providing the services that you enjoy on CBS whether it's linear broadcast or VOD we're keeping you in the store and that's really the design of the service yeah no I, 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 I do get that and it does make complete sense at the moment and it looks like you're doing it beautifully but but do you have conversations at CBS about how long that can go on? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. Bob, I wanted to ask one more question, which is more on the, in, the inventing side of this. I, I meant what I, what I said earlier in that it struck me as a very elegant idea to a very hard problem that would come from a, a broadcast view of the world solving what is today's problem. How, how did you get the original idea? Which of those requirements drove you to it? It was to be everywhere all the time and to really be able to, as viewers migrate from the large screen, I know that's the case in my house, I see everyone watching on tablets and phones, to make sure we could measure that and include it in the total content rating because we knew we were getting leakage in the system. We knew people were migrating to uh, other devices to view the content, and therefore we had to be able to capture that. I could provide session logs to the advertiser, but that's CBS. They needed a third-party independent verification that this was indeed being viewed and that it could be aggregated against the total content rating number which measures PCs, large screens, mobiles, the whole platform, no matter what platform you were on, we could either measure it via acoustic, subaudible sounds, or via the ID3 tag. So please join me once again in thanking Michelle and Jason and Bob for a wonderful session this afternoon. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please tap the like button and also subscribe to our channel to receive notifications when we add new content. For more information about us, please visit simpty.org. We'll see you next time.